Hello, Westside Family Church. Those of you in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, those watching in our Speedway campus, and all those, those of you watching online, including, we're going to do a shout out today for Jack and Linda from Ozaki, Kansas. I don't know where that is, but you are special to us today. Let's give a shout out to Jack and Linda and all those who have joined us online. So glad to have you. I know with this being the big football game day and all that, it's probably a little too early to turn our attention to baseball. But I think uh, by, by what happened last night, I'm going to tell you about it in a minute, I think you'll agree that maybe what happened last night is even a bigger deal than the game today. Last night, uh, Westside Family uh, Church staff partnered with a very prominent African-American church in our community by the name of Macedonia Baptist Church, a pastor, John Brooks. We've become really good friends. We partnered uh, this last week and had lunch together here on our campus. And then last night we went to, uh, to see Underground, which is a play, a really well done play at the Kaufman Center. And it was really cool. We sat together and it was just really cool. Uh, experience. Um, and it, basically this is uh, something, this was really not, this is about the Underground Railroad uh, where uh, black people and white people partner together to do the right thing. And this is not, as someone said last night, this was not about black versus white. This was good versus evil. Amen. And this is a really wonderful journey that our church is on. And uh, before we went to the play, uh, we, were, we, uh, we had a reception. We were invited to a reception uh, by a guy named Dayton Moore and his wife, Mary Ann, who happens to be the general manager for the Kansas City Royals baseball team, who happens, as it turns out, first time I met him, to be a very committed follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, he was speaking uh, to our group last night, and he said, I quote verbatim, I came from dirt, but every good thing that has come out of my life is because of God. That's a pretty big deal, right? Now, the outcome of today's football game is going to have zero impact on the outcome of your life unless you placed a really big bet. <laughs> And I don't recommend that. But what Dayton Moore said from the Kansas City Royals baseball team, if you were to actually embrace that idea with your own life, it'll change the very trajectory of your life forever. Can I get an amen? amen. So today we're going to ask and answer a really big question. And that is, how do I live the Christian life? Actually, we're right dab in the middle of a 10-week series where we're asking and answering that question, how do I live the Christian life? And we have identified the top 10 spiritual practices found in the Bible that if you will engage in them with discipline on a regular basis, you're going to find yourself on a winning team. You're going to find yourself, as uh, the passage of Scripture we're going to look at a little bit later says, you're going to find yourself in the center of God's will. And that will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Anybody up for a piece of uh, being in the center of God's good, pleasing, and perfect will? Say amen. amen. So today, we're going to cover um, one of those practices. We're in practice number five. And to be totally honest with you, this particular practice is a bit challenging. I mean, look at it. We're calling this practice total surrender. And uh, some of you are saying, yikes. Uh, Randy, uh, you know, we're just average, everyday, ordinary people. I mean, I think you're setting the bar just a little too high to, for us to be totally surrendered to God. That's a, it's a tall order. And so you ask, why in the midst of identifying the 30 biggest ideas of the Bible, the 30 biggest, why did you choose total surrender? Was it to bury us in a pile of guilt? Hey, we're just getting to read our Bible on a regular basis. Now you want us to go all in. And the reason is because of the teachings of Jesus. Every time you look at the teachings of Jesus, when he talked about what it meant to follow him, what it meant to be a disciple, he always answered it with all in language. Let me just give you two of many examples. The first one's found on page 247 of your Believe book, if you brought it today, or Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Then in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, just one of several cases, he said, those of you who do not give up everything you, ha you have cannot be 
my disciples. When I look at the teachings of Jesus, I think of immediately a cannonball dive into a pool of water. This is a total commitment to jump. Um, you, this is not the kind of jump where you go to the edge of the pool and you stick your toe in to see if you like the temperature and then stick your foot in and then go in little by little. A cannonball dive is all in. You jump off a cliff and you tuck your knees as close to your chest as you can. You lean back just a little bit and you go vertically into the water with the goal of making the biggest splash that you can. I found uh, the, two, uh, p- uh, the dive of the 2010 uh, Cannonball Dive Champion. Uh, take a look at the screen. True story. There it is. Watch this. This is Cannonball. Watch the tuck. Ready? Tuck. Boom. I also found, I don't know if you saw this on the news, but last week there was a man from Kansas City who tried to beat this record. Take a look at this, last week. Here's my point. Jesus Christ wants you to make the biggest splash with your lives. And so our key idea today is something I'm I'm going to ask you to memorize, but I'm going to invite you later to actually give it a try. Say it out loud with me. Ready? I dedicate my life to fulfill God's purposes. Now, the question is, what percentage of Westsiders have actually done this? Because this looks like it might be totally impossible. But in the teachings of the Bible, it is actually possible in this life to actually get to the place where you cross the line and dive into the pool in a cannonball way. And so we did a survey to find out how many of you have been in this place. And uh, I want you to get in your mind what percentage of Westsiders have actually gotten to this place. And, uh, and uh, before you got a chance to ask, they, they came up 19%. Uh, if you go down the aisle, this is pretty encouraging, actually. If you go down the aisle, for every, fifth, every five people, there is one person who's done a cannonball die for Jesus. And my recommendation for you is that you hang out with these people, that you get to know them. You get to know the secret of their life because these people, what you're going to discover, have found something deeper and sweeter in life that most of us never had. But we can have it if we follow this direction. Matter of fact, Jesus said, it's kind of interesting, he says, when you come to me, the burden of life doesn't get heavier, it actually gets lighter. And it's really counterintuitive to us, isn't it? How does one give up and get more at the end? How does that even possible? Well, Jesus went on to say, uh, if you want to find your life, you have to lose it. And I'm telling you, one of the reasons why so many people are holding back is because that logic doesn't make any sense. They want more out of life, but this direction of giving it all over to God doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But it's actually true. It's counterintuitive, but it's actually true. And 20% of the people here will tell you, no, it actually works. And here's how, here's how it goes. Uh, we start out our lives, a lot of young adults, for example, start off and life is all about me and has little to do with God. I don't see any value of God in my life right now. Maybe you're in that spot. Maybe you know some people. It's okay if you're there, but that's where you're at. You just don't even see the value of it. And, uh, but then you go to step two. Step two is where you cross the line of faith, okay? And now what you're doing is you're saying, you know, I'm going to let God come into my kingdom because I think God might be able to help me out with where I want to go in life, okay? That's a really cool step. And some of you, actually, the majority of you are in that place right now. But 19% of our congregation took a third step, and they said, I'm going to walk out of my kingdom, and I'm going to walk into God's kingdom, and I'm going to govern my whole life based upon what's important to him. And people who've walked into God's kingdom have found there is more in God's kingdom than you ever imagined or ever have seen in yours.
And so the Apostle Paul is going to teach us about this today in our key verse found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, page 240 of your Believe book. I also put it in your program for you to take a look at. Grab a pencil out. I want you to circle and underline a few things as we dive a little deeper into this invitation. First of all, Paul says, therefore. I want you to circle the word therefore. Anytime in Bible study you see the word therefore, it is inviting you to go back to what the author said prior. Paul is going to give us an invitation. He's going to make an ask of us, but he's going to ask us before we look at the invitation to recall uh, what he has said before. Now, in this particular case, it's not what he said at the end of chapter 11, but it's actually what he has said from Romans chapter 1 to chapter 11. He's going to base his argument on you understanding what he has said in these first 11 chapters. Then I want you to underline the words, I urge you, I urge you. These are very strong words in the Greek language that Paul is writing, the Koine Greek language. Uh, in some of your translations, older translations, remember the word, I beseech you. You don't want to know what that means. But essentially what Paul is saying, I am on my knees begging you to listen to what I'm about to tell you. I mean, he is serious about this. Then I want you to underline the word brothers and sisters. Anytime you see this in the Bible, you know that this particular invitation is exclusively for believers in Jesus Christ. So here's the warning label I'm putting out to you. If you're in a place where you haven't crossed the line of faith, you haven't gone all in for Jesus, you haven't accepted his forgiveness, I really need to tell you, do not try this at home without Jesus because it isn't going to work for you. You're going to get so frustrated and so angry at me. I'm just telling you right now, if you're not a believer, get that figured out first and then come back to this passage later. This invitation is only for believers in Jesus. And the reason why is because you have the power of God in you when you trust Christ to actually pull this off. You can't pull this off, what Paul is about to invite you to do, but the spirit of God in you is able to do more than you ever dare to imagine or think. Okay, so if you're a believer in Jesus, let's keep reading. Uh, then he goes on and says, in view of God's mercy, right? Underline that, in view of God's mercy. And basically saying, in view of everything I've told you in chapters one through 11, in view of all that Jesus has done to get us to this point, and basically what he's teaching about is a concept, a very powerful concept some of you so desperately need to know about. It's called grace. He is teaching us about the power of grace. And we are not entitled to the life that's been made available to us. So there's no entitlement here. We don't deserve it. As a matter of fact, just as one example, in verses in chapters 1 through 11, I'm going to point out chapter 5 and verse 8. Write that reference down. Look at it later. It's a very popular passage of Scripture, but listen carefully. Paul writes, But God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul does a masterful job reminding us that we all, as human beings, are in deep, deep trouble before we met Christ. We were facing death with no redemption. As a matter of fact, he says to us very clearly, you are already dead. You are already dead in your sin. What he means is because you were born as an offspring of Adam, you were born with sin flowing through your veins, which keeps you separate from God. You were already born doomed before you even got out of the chute. That doesn't seem very fair, but I had a, my navigator friend that I referred to a couple of weeks ago uh, in airplane navigation says, uh, in the Air Force, we don't refer to a plane uh, having an accident on the ground. What we basically say is the accident took place way back here. We're just simply waiting for the plane to arrive at the crash site. Does that make sense? The accident, the mistake was made back here all we're waiting for is the plane to arrive at its crash site. The same thing is true with our life. The mistake uh, was made when we were born apart from God. All we're waiting for is for us each to arrive at our crash site. You are already dead in your sin. Then Christ stepped in and made a way possible by his grace through faith. 
the motivation to actually do what Paul is going to invite us to do, and I'm going to give it to you next, comes out of a person understanding and getting the mercy of God on our lives. In view of God's mercy, we were in deep, deep trouble, already dead in our sin, awaiting to arrive at the crash site, our, the death of our physical bodies. But then Christ stepped in. We were not entitled to it. We did not deserve it. But he provided a way for us to live forever. In view of what he has done, he's now going to make a request. Okay? For the person to be saved... They have to first of all know that they're lost. And some of you right now that are holding back, you're holding back, I know, and it's okay. We want you to be here, we want you to watch online, you're holding back. One of the reasons why I think you're holding back is because you haven't come fully to terms at just how lost you are. And when you capture that and then add into it the mercy of God to rescue you when you don't deserve it, you will come running to his mercy like many of us had, screaming for God's mercy and forgiveness, which he always offers. So the, per the person who's going to do this gets the full mercy of God. And now here's the ask, okay? To offer your bodies as living sacrifices. I want you to un underline the word or even circle the word living sacrifices sacrifices. Now, the Jewish readers would have understood the concept of sacrifice more than the Gentile readers or listeners because of the Old Testament sacrificial system. But for the Jewish people uh, reading these words, it would have been a very disruptive idea, a very backwards idea, because in their experience, the sacrifice starts off living and ends up dead. In this sacrifice, the sacrifice starts off dead and ends up living, dead to our sins, alive in Christ. So I ask you this question, which is harder, being a dead sacrifice or a living sacrifice? Which do you suppose? Well, I love the old story of the farm animals that wanted to do something special for their farmer because he was such a kind guy. And so the chicken got all of the farm animals together and said, hey, let's make our farmer a special breakfast. And he said, I will provide the eggs. And then he turned to the pig and said, and you'll provide the bacon. <laughs> to which the pig said, wait a minute, for you, this requires a contribution. But for me, it requires a total commitment. What God is asking for us here is not a little contribution. Five dollars worth of God, please. He's asking for bacon. Dying for God would be hard. If you've done any study on the life of the martyrs who stood for their faith and were burned at the stake, I can't even imagine the trauma of that. But I'm going to suggest that living for him is actually harder. Someone said the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. I like that. <laughs> so if you're taking notes, write this first principle down. Ready? Dying for God is a single decision. Living for God is a daily decision. Mm, that's good. I find whenever we come upon, upon ideas like this, these gargantuan, like outlandish ideas in the Bible, we can't even wrap our head around what's being asked of us. We, we go to our children because they put it into simple terms. I told you the story before, but it bears repeating. Uh, in a church service one Sunday, the offering plate came along and, and, and the plate came to this little girl sitting with her parents. When she got the plate, she took the plate and sat it into the aisle and then she stepped into the plate and her parents were whispering, what are you doing? Stop that. Stop it. What are you doing? And the little girl turned to her parents and she said, in Sunday school, I learned that I was supposed to give myself to God. Oh, that's what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for you to not just give him a couple bucks. He's looking for you to take both feet and to step into that offering plate. 
This is what Paul is asking of us. I like the way John Stott put it in his writings on the book of Romans. Take a look at this. He said, our feet will walk in his paths. Our lips will speak the truth and spread the gospel. Our tongue will bring healing. Our hands will lift up those who have fallen and perform many mundane tasks as well like cooking and cleaning, typing and mending. Our arms will embrace the lonely and the unloved. Our ears will listen to the cries of the distressed. Our eyes will look humbly and patiently towards God. In a nutshell, our whole body is involved in the daily act of worshiping God. It is a cannonball dive. It is placing your whole body into the offering plate. Now, this kind of sacrificial life does not make sense to the person who is yet far from God. It just does not make any sense why someone would do this. A few years back, when I was still living in San Antonio, I was taking a tour of a, of, a, of a ministry called Haven for Hope. It is a massive ministry that brings a number of homeless organizations under one roof to help the homeless move from homelessness to independence. And the executive director was a member of the church that I pastored and was a deep follower of Jesus. And, and, uh, and by the way, there's a ministry in Kansas City that's growing to this magnitude. It's called Avenue of Life, which is a ministry that you'll be pleased to know. Westside was on the ground floor of starting and is still very much fueling. I was at a, at a big uh, KC ball last week uh, and this ministry was being highlighted and Westside Family Church I was so proud was all over the support of this organization. You guys are amazing. We are standing up for issues of racial reconciliation. We're coming alongside the homeless and we're not going to stop are we church? Man, we're just going to keep pressing pressing hard. Well, I talked to this executive director and he got to the place in the tour where he said, okay, now we're in the dental section where we give help uh, uh, to the homeless in the dental area. He said, on this side, uh, government requires us to separate them. This is Christian dentistry, where the, the people who volunteer here are able to talk about Jesus. Now, across the hallway here, just a little hallway, he said, this is the secular dental side. This is the place where people, volunteers come and, and offer up dental help uh, for the homeless, but they can't talk about Jesus. And he said, here's a little secret that no one wants to come to terms with. Whether it's on the Christian side or the secular side, all of the volunteers are followers of Jesus. And I said, well, why? He says, Randy, think about it. What person in their right mind would give the best hours of their day to help a person who will never be able to return the favor? Who? Nobody but someone who understands the mercy of God in their own life. And he went on to say that if, in fact, and Hollywood would totally deny this, and it's completely clueless, even though I like some of them, um, with, with, he said, if the Christians were to disappear today, this world would go into a tailspin and in utter darkness because no one is mindful of how many Christians are boots on the ground in crevices where hurting people are at, whether it's Christian or secular. That inspires me. People who live captured by the mercies of God. Now, in the text, you'll see he uses the word proper. Underline or circle the word proper. In other translations, it's the word reasonable. I love the word reasonable. Basically, it's saying a person who captures the mercy of God is going to offer up their life as a living sacrifice because it just seems like a reasonable suggestion. Based upon everything that God did to rescue me from death, it only seems reasonable that I would give back the remaining years of my life on this earth to the one who has given me eternal life. It is just simply reasonable. Now the question is, how does one do that? How does one become a living sacrifice? Now, every time you hear me say the word do, I want you to add to the words, how do you do this in the power of the Holy Spirit? I remind you, it is impossible to pull this level of commitment off without the Spirit. But if the Spirit is in you, which you got when you became a Christian, and you yield to this in your life, it ignites the Spirit of God within you and gives you the capacity in God to actually move in this direction and to take the dive. Now, in the second verse, he gives the answer. Take a look at it. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, Paul is going to give us uh, two action steps here, and I want you to circle them. The first comes in the action word conform. 
Circle the word conform. And then the second one is the word transformed. Circle the word transformed. The first one is uh, put in the negative. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The idea is being shaped or influenced from the outside in. Okay? Matter of fact, J.B. Phillips' uh, translation uh, words our second point beautifully. Write this down. Don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. Don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold from the outside in. If Paul were uh, living during our times, he would say something like this. Be careful of the influence of the people that you're hanging with have on you. Be careful of the people you hang with because they are having great influence on you. Some of you need to dump some of the people you're hanging with right now because they're having a negative influence on you. Paul would say, be careful of the influence of television, of the internet, of Facebook, of music in shaping your mind. You may not think it's shaping your mind. You may like the beat. You may like the actors. You may like the show. But be very careful, Paul would say, because little by little, it is shaping the way in which you think and the way in which you act. And mark my word, what is on television today that seems seems outlandish, five years from our five five years from now, mark my word, it will be normative in our society. And I don't mean to get up into anybody's business. I don't mean to make anybody feel guilty. But this um, late term abortion thing, I mean, this has got the hair on the back of my head standing up and I want to get after somebody. I have to tell you that for sure. But right now it feels outlandish. But I promise you, five years from now, it will be normative in our society and we will start talking about infanticide. I promise you, it's coming and you need to be careful. You need to be careful because this is exactly what brought the Roman Empire down and it will bring us down as well. And so Paul says, you may not be able to stop the momentum in the United States, but you can in your own mind. Paul said to the Corinthians, who really struggled in their spiritual life. Take a look at this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we capture every thought to make it obedient to Christ. He's saying for the follower of Christ, the thoughts and ideas that come into your head daily are never to be given free reign. He said, every thought that comes into your brain or through your eye gate, you capture it, you handcuff it, and you interrogate it, and you do not release it into your brain until it conforms to the obedience and to the message of Jesus Christ. Not just the thoughts that tempt us to do bad things. I mean, that thing, but it's the thoughts that ultimately lead to lies that are sounding off in your head that take you to a dark place. I very vulnerably shared with you a few weeks ago. It was very, very difficult. I could have continued the image that I'm a very strong person, but I let you in on the fact that I went through a season, a pretty serious season, and not just a couple of days of clinical depression and anxiety, all right? I mean, I was taking pills. I was in a deep place. And and I'll tell you, one of the things that I do now more than ever, and I think one of the things that got me there is that I dropped the guard in not taking captive and interrogating the voices in my head and the lies. And I started to believe it and it took me to a bad place. And once I got into a bad place, it took me eight months to get out. And so I hold every thought captive now, not because I don't wanna just do bad things, but because I don't wanna go back to a dark place. You better take every thought and you better handcuff it and interrogate it. And if it doesn't match up with what Jesus says about you, kick it out. But he also tells us to do something positive. Let me wrap up with this one. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform is the Greek word metamorphosis, where we get the word metamorphosis. And it has the image of a caterpillar who enters into a cocoon and then struggles from the inside out and is eventually released to the world as a butterfly. This is the image that Paul has for us in Christ, that we are transformed from the inside out. So write this final point down. Be changed from the inside out through saturating your mind in God's word. Saturating your mind in God's word. That's why, church, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to keep coming back to you and inviting you to saturate your mind to renew your mind in the word of God. I do it not because I don't have something else to say. 
I do it because it has proven to be the thing that will take you to the place that you've always wanted to go. But I got to get you renewing your mind. I had a professor in seminary who basically brought one day, he brought in a big old filet mignon steak, about an eight ouncer. And he stuck it into a, a bucket of teriyaki sauce. And he left it there the entire time. At the end, he said, do you remember the commercial where the guy breaks the eggs and puts it in a frying pan and says, this is your brain on drugs? He pulled out the meat saturated in teriyaki sauce, and he says, this is your mind renewed in the word of God. And when you cook it up, every single bite will have a hint of teriyaki. Teriyaki sauce for Jesus. Don't ever let that idea leave your mind. Mm. Total surrender is our fifth door today. Seemed a little bit overwhelming at first, but today we've tried to open up the scriptures and lock the door for you and make it accessible to you in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we open up this door today and we invite you to say the big idea with this church. Ready? I dedicate my life to God's purposes. And now we want to dare you to actually practice it, to actually walk through this door. And if you'll make this a daily activity, if you will do the cannonball dive, if you will jump in with both feet into the offering plate, Paul says, if you'll do that, you're going to discover one day you wake up in the center of God's will, which is good, it's pleasing, and it is perfect. So I ask you this final question. What is the cannonball plunge that God is inviting you to take today? We know from our research of you that one and every 14 person here hasn't yet come to know Christ. And that's okay. You're exploring. It's all cool. Take the amount of time you want. I wouldn't like wait forever, but, uh, but take, take all the time you need. And, but you're a person who just has not crossed over yet. You haven't taken that cannonball plunge. And some of you have actually made that commitment in your heart, but you've never gone public through baptism. Jesus basically says, you got you to gotta do that. And, and baptism is really a beautiful picture of a cannonball plunge, isn't it? It, it basically means uh, being buried in, in death. You are acknowledging that your life was over and you're dead to the old guy and you're coming out of the water alive as a new creature. You know, I, you know so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you want to be baptized next week, we're going to do it in the service, okay? So you just need to write on your little brochure there and tear it off. And we're going to tell you where to put it in a moment. And I would love, maybe not next week, but I'd love to get to the place where the way we do baptisms at Westside is not the pastor like doing it, like cannonball dives. Wouldn't that be the coolest thing? Someone like taking a, a 20 yard jump and then boom, down in the water, you know, and you say, is that right? I'll touch you on your way out, you know, bless it and all that stuff. Right. So maybe that's you. Okay. But for others of you, you've already done that, but God's asking you to make another dive, you know, Another dive, an abandonment into his principles, into his kingdom. For some of you, it's your marriage. I've talked to some of you about your marriage. And uh, you're just not going to make it if you stay in your kingdom. The only way you're going to make it is to walk in the kingdom of God and, and humble yourself. You're just not going to make it on your current strategy. And I'd hate to see you lose your legacy. And the cannonball dive is for you to hump. The jump is to humble yourself. Humble yourself. If you'll humble yourself and stay with that in Christ based on his mercies, we might just be able to save this thing. For some of it, it's your finances. You're tired of, tired of tracing after shiny objects. You need God's principles because it's taking you nowhere. For some of you, it's your job. You know, it's time. God, I talked to a doctor, and he basically, he got an annual award, which makes me so proud anytime, like, he got the award at his hospital, big hospital. And he thanked God, which he's not allowed to do. You know, and he had so many people come up to him and say, thank you. Some, for some of you, it's time for you to run your business or enter to the workplace and take a cannonball die for Jesus. I love Chick-fil-A. I'm just telling you right now. I love Chick-fil-A, man. Do you know that they have a restaurant uh, in the Atlantic Station uh, uh, Stadium today? But they're not open. Do you know how many bazillions of dollars that they're giving up? None. The answer is zero. Because people respect that and their chicken's so good, they just wait till Monday. Right? I dare you to take the same conviction in your work. For me, my cannonball dive, I just made one last March 23rd. And you may not see it, you know, you may not see it, but um, coming here to Kansas was a very disruptive idea to me. I had never even stepped foot in this state. Never. And yet, God uh, was calling me to jump off a cliff and come to Kansas City. I had mentors that speak into my life 
And, and the reason is because God has whispered to me, there are some very special people at a church called Westside Family Church that are really crazier than you think about me. And that if you will partner with them and dare to challenge them, they will go further in my kingdom than any place on the planet. And so I jumped off. I jumped off. And I'm in that free fall right now. And I'm scared. I really am scared. You know, I really am scared. But I am believing. I am believing that God has not led me astray and that together we're going to make a big splash for Jesus in our lives. Amen. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to stand. We have stations all over the place here. And I invite you to go to the one closest to you, a chance to respond to the Lord as we're singing and worship. We have communion here. You can come and get your communion, the, the bread and the cup representing the body and blood of Jesus. And, and take it right there at the station or take it back to your seat and ponder. You can bring your offering uh, to the plate or if you want to be baptized, you can take a little note and stick it in the plate and we'll get back with you uh, this week and get you ready for your cannonball plunge next Sunday. Be standing as we worship God.